uh, let's start. Uh, I can just say in the very beginning that I haven't asked you uh, where are you ba based right now or uh, with which uh, context you are familiar. Uh, due to my curiosity, it was more about that I would like to tailor this workshop so it somehow uh, suits different contexts that you can relate to that. And then, of course, we can explore uh, together similarities and differences. Uh, when it comes to the actual content of this uh, workshop, we are going to focus on legal and social obstacles to good treatment of sex workers and how actually they affect uh, health services for, for the group. On the other hand, the very health of this group. Uh, since I moved to Sweden in 2016, and I have been mostly researching and working uh, with the uh, uh, with the focus group here in in um, Sweden, um, I would focus on the Swedish example, and from that we can draw these parallels that I uh, talked about. Uh, lastly, and probably uh, the most important thing, is that I would like us to identify strategies uh, for responding better to identified challenges and how we can actually reduce these inequalities with some uh, uh, examples of the best practice and positive examples from our context, context including mine. And I can just say that I know that the focus uh, will be, of course, on sex workers, but I will try to keep um, uh, like intersectional approach uh, when I'm talking about the group of, of sex workers. I would like you to bear in your mind that I am uh, mostly uh, working uh, with trans people and MSM sex workers. MSM stands for men who have sex with men. And I can also say that many of them uh, have migrant experience and many of them um, uh, are practicing a practice of drug use in their daily life and for different reasons. So let me start with the legal context uh, here in Sweden. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, uh, here in Sweden, we have a famous uh, Swedish slash Nordic model that is actually based on uh, client criminalization, which means that it is legal to sell sexual services, but not to buy it. Uh, so uh, persons who sell sex, sex workers are not criminalized in that way. Uh, on the other hand, we have two groups that are, these are sex buyers and also third party. And then we will explore what this third party actually means and who that can be, at least in our uh, context here in Sweden. Uh, the law that we have is called uh, sex buyers law uh, in, in uh, English and uh, the goal of this law from the very beginning, from the 90s, uh, was to eliminate demand. So not to punish persons who sell sex, also not to punish, although they are criminalized, people who buy sex, but to provide, uh, uh, to reduce demand and in the end eliminate it completely and at the same time, providing good support and treatment for persons who need it, like both sex buyers and sex sellers. Um, I think this is important to mention because uh, the law in the very beginning and the whole presentation of it uh, didn't have this like a uh, stigmatic note that we have today in Sweden when we are talking, for example, about sex buyers. So we have that shift that we will talk about. Um, when it comes to how this law actually works, 
uh we had a very very long time to to see uh how the law is successful or not in a way how much they it helps actually uh persons who sell sex uh i mentioned this uh, sex pattern and sex work unit that i am working with harm reduction programs different sort of initiatives from outreach programs condom distribution counseling uh, for for sex workers etc cetera, etc cetera. and uh, what i could sort of identify as as the issues that i had uh, had an opportunity to either uh, hear from the persons i meet or to read actually from from uh, different court decisions that uh, we got in our organization uh the first uh, insight when it comes to situation in Sweden is that the law actually increased vulnerability. Uh, that means that many sex workers are actually saying that it's very difficult to screen the client and to sort of uh, get all necessary information from a person that they are going to meet because many times clients are using this I am doing the crime here argument, which means that they have to adjust and adapt to their terms. So their ne negotiation power really goes down in that way. On the other hand, just to give a few examples from uh, persons that I have had opportunity to meet, it can be that they are going to uh, places where they even do not know what uh, what that place has for address because a client doesn't want to reveal their address because they are afraid of police. So they meet unknown men usually in the unknown location and then they are going to some location where uh, actually uh, they are uh, doing like uh, a, a sex work as a service. Evictions is the second thing. Uh, that is this part that I mentioned about third party. Uh, third party can be anyone uh, who uh, assists slash help sex workers to do their business. And it's really broad. Generally, what we could see that uh, many times partners are targets. As I told to you before, sex workers are not criminalized. And let's say if we are talking about a cis woman uh, uh, who is in, in heterosexual marriage and there is no way for the authorities to make her stop uh, to do sex work, we had a situation where uh, her husband was actually accused for uh, being like involved as a third party Uh or uh, actually uh, sort of uh, uh, being a contact between her and buyers, which was absolutely not true in that case. On the other hand, we also had situations where friends of sex workers were threatened because they were driving them with their car, waiting in front, for example, while they are uh, done with the, with, uh, with the business in order to um, uh, them to feel a bit more safe. And then we also had one situation in that way where a person was accused and uh, how do you say in English, like uh, th there is a court decision uh, where a person uh, was, uh, according to the court, guilty uh, for third party involvement. Danger of losing parental rights. I would say that we haven't had a situation that someone lost custody over their kids, but we had a situation where social workers have been asking and asking and asking, uh, are you sure that you do not want to, to quit sex work? Are you sure this is a good environment for your child, etc.? cetera? Uh, sex workers also talk about negative effect on, uh, on uh, their health. Um, in a way that uh, I don't know if you know about it, but like uh, in many countries where sex work is criminalized, but especially in Sweden, condom is used as an evidence. And the situation happened that uh, in order to avoid uh, 
encountering police who could in some way prove that a person has been doing sex work. Uh, they are uh, sometimes uh, uh, making a decision to not use condoms in order to uh, avoid police uh, and uh, to not have a lot of condoms at home, for example, if uh, police raid their apartment uh, for the sake of looking for a client, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the most striking thing that is happening in Sweden is deportation of asylum seekers. Uh, and in the court uh, decisions, it is written that their lifestyle go against the Swedish values. And here you see like this sort of double standard where sex workers who are, let's say, uh, Swedish citizens are... Um, uh, included in certain programs, of course, push to stop. But on the other hand, you have people that are deported for something that is not considered a crime. And I think this is something that we have to talk more about, uh, especially like uh, within the um, activism for, for asylum rights. Um, the, uh, what more? Yes, asylum seekers, I said that. Uh, then also we have cases of the EU nationals uh, who got a ban uh, to enter Sweden uh, because they were doing sex work. We had a person from Romania, that is what I remember, who had that particular uh, situation. And the most striking is that... Uh, there are also cases of persons who had temporary residence permit, so not permanent, not citizenship in Sweden, who got a ban uh, on entering to Sweden. Uh, lastly, uh, sex workers talk about uh, that this law in some way removes their agency, someone else decide for them uh, if uh, this is a right thing to do or not, uh, and uh, claim that uh, they have a right to decide what they want to do with their body. And lastly, we have this risk to report crime. No, I do not want to go to police. I know I'm not doing a crime, but I will have a police in front of my house and they are going to check the clients. Thus, they are going to ruin my business and everything will go to hell. So I try uh, like to, to put different sort of arguments, but based on what I could hear and what I could learn about. And I hope that I uh, have everything here. Um, as I said, as I mentioned before, we have this um, connection between migration policies and uh, client criminalization or Swedish or Nordic model. I already uh, mentioned that uh, this is a ground for deportation uh, uh, in Sweden, and it is specified in Alliance Act. Uh, we will talk a bit later on about how this uh, discourse of victims, how sex workers are seen as victims of sexual violence, and how they need to be saved, generally women, from violence, generally from men. So this is like this double like uh, double-sided uh, situation that is very difficult to understand um, how it operates. And uh, when it comes to concrete um, findings about this, I would definitely recommend, uh, by the way, can you see these pictures in the right angle or I have to remove? Uh... Yeah. Okay. So you don't see my we camera see or you see that. Okay. Yes. Uh, I would recommend definitely um, the research from uh, Nina Vualajarvi uh, that is originally from Finland, uh, working at the London School of Economics and Political Science. And to my knowledge, uh, Nina has done the biggest research, uh, qualitative research in terms of numbers of persons uh, interviewed, um, uh, both in, uh, in the Nordic context. So I'm talking about Sweden, Denmark, uh, 
no, sorry, uh, Sweden, Norway, and Finland. These three contexts is what Nina is focused on. And I also had the pleasure to write um, a foreword for, for the Swedish version of this report. Uh, the second dynamic that is important to understand when it comes to uh, migration, poli uh, migration policies and my migrants uh, who sell sex in Sweden are the dynamics that are related to trans sex workers in a way that, let's say, down you, you can see these are my theses. As I said, they are focused on uh, persons with asylum and transgender experiences. Um, and uh, here you can see that people who are in asylum process in Sweden, they do not have a right to access transgender uh, health care, gender affirming care um, here in uh, Sweden based on the law because it is not considered as urgent emergency medical medical care. Uh, on the other hand, we have this, I would not say phenomenon, but one of the ways for migrant trans women especially uh, has been to, to uh, start with sex work once being in asylum in Sweden. And uh, that really uh, was of my interest and like made me to research more like within that area because I had a lot of friends around me uh, who had like the, the same situation and I was just interested like to see what is this about. Um, yes, uh, lastly, uh, when it comes to being a migrant and sex worker, we can talk about this racial profiling, prejudices and stigma to certain communities that exist in Sweden. And here I mentioned two. Uh, I think I have to remove this camera. Okay. So here I mentioned two. Uh, the one is a Thai community, uh, generally in relation to massage uh, parlors. Is that how you say massage salons, massage parlors in, in English? Uh, where uh, when a person, when they talk, for example, in media about uh, persons who sell sex within these uh, uh, massage salons, they, they use the word Thai massage salons. They are not saying anymore massage salons, but Thai, ma thai massage salons as like one, uh, one concept. Uh, thus, it happens that uh, even for, let's say, Thai women who who are not even in the sex work business, they have a situation that uh, clients are asking, uh, not clients, but yeah, actually clients, but not sex work clients, uh, asking for a happy ending and uh, generally like a lot of uh, sort of discriminatory behavior coming uh, towards, towards Thai women, like many, many situations that are very easy to observe. And lastly, lastly we have uh, this uh, profiling of Ukrainian women uh, where uh, there is like a lot of media representations, uh, how men are using uh, vulnerable Ukrainian women who fled the war and uh, the, this is the situation that we have now that we have to be like observant and to give like support uh, to, to, to this community uh, in general. So there is a debate about that, like mostly, mostly in media, I would say. Um, Generally, the problem with the Swedish context is that we have this conflation of human trafficking and sex work. It is generally seen uh, as the same thing. Uh, also, within the law is actually uh, specified uh, in a way that uh, we have, for example, um, uh, how, how do you say, a uh, unit, like as a state a state agency, a unit uh, 
for like against uh, human trafficking and prostitution. So it is always together. It is also together when it comes to certain regulations. So sex work or prostitution, to use uh, Swedish language to call it, uh, is generally uh, like always used with with um, uh, human trafficking. Um, there is no space, as I said, to see sex work as a personal choice. And generally, when they are talking about sex workers who, I don't know, who are loud and who are like, oh, but I'm doing this because I want to do it, like regardless uh, of, of uh, what the context is, generally the response is that what they are doing, uh, it is a sort of self-harming behavior. Uh, they are actually exploiting themselves, but they are not even aware of that. Uh, and uh, when we are talking about exit programs, like state support programs for persons who sell sex, they are literally based on this like uh, uh, avoidance of self-harm, how to protect yourself from self-harming, and very, very much focused on the notion that majority of sex workers have PTSD. And uh, that is also a central aspect in the exit programs like treatment of, of uh, uh have I said STD, PTSD, I wanted to say. Um, and of course, in the end, we have this argument that there is no consent in sex work uh, and exit programs that I uh, mentioned uh, generally is what is happening for Swedish nationals. And that is a difference from migrant um, um, sex workers here in Sweden, which is, again, very contradictory because they are seen as victims uh, by the, by the uh, of course, like uh, legally, but also in the public narrative. So when we are talking about uh, the social context, like what is the situation when it comes to the public opinion about sex work, etc. in Sweden, uh, I, for this limited time, I decided that a good thing would be to focus on uh, two parts. One of them is this moral panic in the society that exists around uh, sex work. And then also uh, a very, very big increase in, in um, uh, sort of attitudes and, and opinions that are uh, very much sex negative in its uh, essence. Not sex, of course, sex work negative, but sex negative overall. Uh, we will talk also about that. Uh, the first uh, social obstacle that I could think about is something that is definitely related to this guilt by association. I don't know like if you heard about that, but uh, it is like um, uh, more or less in this context, I use it uh, when someone is judging or putting uh, someone or something in the same category simply because there is some kind of relationship or association. This is just like a stupid example. Voldemort is evil. Voldemort from Harry Potter. Uh, that is the sentence one. Sentence two, Voldemort is vegan. Se uh, and then conclusion, all vegans are evil. That kind of argumentation is very much used here in Sweden when it comes to sex work. And if we use the same logic, you could also see that that is a situation that we have. For example, some sex workers are victims of human trafficking. Sex work or prostitution, how they call it in Sweden, equals human trafficking. Human trafficking, uh, where sexual services are, or sexual services, exploitation of person, uh, like sexual services and body is included, is actually equalized with sexual violence. And conclusion is that sex work actually equals uh, sexual violence. Um, this is very well known, uh, that is used like in, in many, many contexts that are actually against uh, 
against uh, recognition and decriminalization of sex work. But one very interesting thing is that uh, this kind of argumentation or guilt by association is not used like for many other things, or actually it is used much less. I can just give you an example. Think about... Uh, uh, yeah, Aris, for example, from, from the context of Italy. Uh, think about, uh, let's say, uh, Roman Catholic Church and the cases of uh, sexual assaults that have been happening uh, there. I do not think that it is uh, co that common as it is common to say that sex work is uh, a sexual violence, that all churches are bad. In all churches, sexual violence happen. Of course, probably there are people who, who think like that, but not in, in that amount. On the other hand, uh, at least here in Sweden, the when it comes to sexual violence, according to statistics, like government statistics, the uh, majority of um, sexual violence happens. Where do you think it happens? You can just say, like, I cannot see uh, if someone raised hand. Okay, so it happens at home. So we have this uh, partner's violence, or in Swedish, and then when we talk about sexual, the, the reported cases of sexual violence, like the majority of them are coming either from partner or from like um, clo clo persons close uh, to, to the victim uh, within like this uh, home setting. And of course, like for homes, we do not use the argument that... Uh, we should ban all the houses and we should ban all the churches because sexual violence can happen there. Uh, I simplify this so that just like make us think a little bit. Uh, uh, um. Yes, um, in that way, uh, I feel that here in Sweden we have something that definitely resembles moral panic. Uh, and here I'm using a sort of approach where when I think about moral panic, I think about this public anxiety in response to some problem that is like uh, seen as like very much threatening to the whole society and to our values, etc. If we go back to sexual violence, that is, of course, a problem. However, sexual violence is like equalized with sex work and then sex work is seen as a problem of society. And that is very much this um, um, climate that we have in, in Sweden uh, today. Um, moral panic never happens alone. Uh, there are factors that contribute to that uh, to high extent. The first one is media representation. What we actually as the Swedish residents see uh, and read in the newspapers and watch on TV when it comes to sex work. Generally, we are hearing about uh, the victims of uh, human trafficking, about terrible crimes, and about uh, the activity of prostitution as they call it, uh, that uh, these women were forced to do. Thus, there is association immediately with human trafficking, as I said before. On the other hand, when we have the narratives of persons who sell sex, I would say that 99% when it comes to Swedish media, like both uh, news, like uh, uh, on the like uh, digital news, uh, TV, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it is about these recovery stories where we have a um, person that was doing sex work before and now is very much aware how that was bad and how much it harmed her we generally just hear like women's stories. And I am 100% sure that that is the case for these persons. And uh, I think it is very important to learn about uh, problematic that, uh, that these persons have. However, it really happens that 
uh, this is the only kind of narrative that is generally allowed on the mainstream media. So we have media is the first thing that affect this moral panic. Then we also have political agendas that affects public opinion, but also public opinion affects political agendas. So it's it's actually really difficult to go back in time and see what started first and how actually this has been uh, developing like in relation to sex work like overall but when it comes to Sweden you can see that all major political parties are against le either legalization or the decriminalization of sex work and a way like to get sort of public sympathy is generally like talking about how we should combat uh, this uh, violence against women uh, and uh, help the victims from, from the circles of prostitution and human trafficking. However, there are some political parties that are uh, for decriminalization of sex work. So if you are interested about that, since EU elections are coming, ask me the question about that. Uh, and lastly, we have activist groups. Uh, are also uh, very much contributing to this moral panic where we have anti-trafficking organization in Sweden that are almost equal to anti-sex work organization. Of course, they, they do work like about uh, human trafficking, anti-human trafficking work, uh, but it is always with this, almost always, let me, let me, I don't want to generalize, is about like being against prostitution at the same time. And also there is some tendency that I could also notice as, as someone who, uh, work in LGBT organization that uh, it's very much combined with this like anti-gender movement and anti-gender activist group. Somehow, almost always, they are uh, anti anti sex work in terms of uh, like their narratives and statements that we can read and hear about. So far, we talked about moral panic as a civil issue. So we have this concern of people as a civil issue concern where sex work is actually sexual violence. And we are supposed to do something about that. Um, on the other hand, moral, moral panic can be like very traditional and maybe more of a traditional slash moral issue than civil issue in, in that way, where sex work is seen as either sin, where we have factors of religion, uh, sex is forbidden outside of marriage philosophy that is like used, used uh, in, in many countries, but like there are uh, like uh, persons who, who believe that here in Sweden as well. Uh, and then you also have uh, uh, this um, uh, moral panic about dishonesty of sex work or more or less that this is a dishonest mean to earn for, for yourself. So you are not in, within this uh, panic attack. You are not seen as a, as a victim, but you are seen as as a bad person, as a dishonest person, how can you earn money through your body? That is like a big, big uh, issue, like in that way. Uh, again, that is like a social norm that exists. And in my opinion, like becoming like much, much stronger, uh, like uh, as, as time is passing. Let me see. Uh, for those of you who are in Sweden, I think from Sweden, I think that you are going to be very familiar with this. Right now, the focus when it comes to anything that has to do with sex uh, is, uh, except like sex work, 
the focus is very much on sex clubs or these adult cinemas or por biographer in, in Swedish, where we have a lot of documentaries, media representation, where they are saying we should close all sex club because uh, a lot of sexual violence is happening there and uh, uh, there is like, this is not a healthy space to be. Uh, so now we have even politicians like discussing about closing sex clubs in Sweden. I think there is a connection uh, like with argumentation. That's why I just used it here. And also I did a workshop yesterday uh, for one, the biggest sex club here in Stockholm on consent, uh, simply to to show a stand or we to show a stand as an organization that uh, sex positivity is important and that we do not have a right to decide which sexual practices someone prefer or if someone can or cannot go to the sex clubs. Uh, this whole situation, at least in activist circles that I am uh, around uh, is called um, uh, Swedish Neo-Puritanism, uh, especially like in academia, there were also panel points, for example, during Stockholm Pride. Also, as I could see, like this year, it will be a lot about uh, that. Uh, and once again, it is coming uh, from this like uh, neo-Puritanism as a, as a concept to describe uh, negatively uh, uh, those uh, who criticize uh, sec uh, se sexual liberation, nudity, sexual motives in commercial, for example, pornography, etc. So I just know I wrote here like uh, negative and derogatory because I could also observe that it is seen as derogatory uh, from from uh, waves that are that are called as uh, uh, neo-Puritanistic here in Sweden. Before this discussion, let me just check something. No, I didn't miss anything here. Okay, so after Rafi, if Rafi, if you want to, to introduce yourself, uh, then the question or discussion round where we are discussing around the question of similarities and differences uh, in your country when it comes to this uh, sex negativity and um, uh, moral panic uh, around sex and sex work at the same time. Do you recognize any of these? Is it like completely different? That would be nice to discuss. Okay, so for this part, we will just focus uh, a bit on these effects of all of these uh, uh, legal and social obstacles that we that we talked about, and actually how they influence uh, uh, health as well as health services of uh, persons who sell sex. Um, of course, as you could see from many of these. Uh, examples like we have uh, uh, a lot of stigma and a lot of discrimination and what I would conclude is that that it is coming both from uh, this like uh, legal and uh, social social fa factors although legal factors were probably partly not being intended to to uh, discriminate and stigmatize for example uh, uh, sex purchase act uh, or nordic model on the other hand i think that uh, migration policies were aimed to to discri uh, discriminate and and sort of uh, remove uh, certain certain persons that are seen as um, uh, going too much uh, 
uh, beyond Swedish norm of, of uh, what is acceptable and uh, what is a part of the Swedish values, as they say in the uh, court decisions. Um, when we say health, uh, I think it is very important to think uh, about health uh, in a way that we are discussing uh, both uh, physical, mental, and sexual health uh, of sex workers. Uh, and generally, when it comes to the effect uh, of uh, both these legal and, and social obstacles, I generally uh, can say that information from my personal experience, of course, my research, as well as um, as well as peer insights uh, that I can get from a persons that I am working with within a sex pattern of sex work. Uh, there is also one more organization. Uh, actually, we are not organization. We are unit, and we are not. Uh, uh, one hundred percent. Uh, uh, by sex workers to sex workers unit, although we we work with a peer approach as well, but there is a lot of persons uh, there who are not peers. Red Umbrella Sweden is the only uh, 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 organization in Sweden with persons who are active sex workers. Uh, so when you are thinking about the context of decriminalization, uh, when you think about uh, persons who, uh, sex workers who think that uh, sex work should be a question of personal choice, uh, that is only Red Umbrella Sweden. The rest is uh, some hybrids of, of anti-trafficking organizations and anti-prostitution organizations. And then there is uh, a members group within our LGBTQI organization that is called Queer Sex Workers. Um, it is a members group of, uh, of um, members uh, of RFSL Stockholm who, who are sex workers. The group is not uh, that much big, but I think it is a good example for a strategy on how to, to normalize, uh, normalize uh, sex work and sort of include it uh, in the debate also within um, LGBTQI circles. Uh, we didn't have it officially in terms of having the members group Teals uh, queer sex workers came, and uh, of course that was uh, part of uh, creating a low threshold service and and uh, something that we did all together. All of these that are written here, we talked about already, right? All of these like effects, and now you can just analyze and think uh, about different ways that all of these can affect uh, uh, physical, mental, uh, or sexual uh, health uh, of, of sex workers. Uh, increased vulnerability, uh, I'm doing the crime here. Uh, safety issues are the issues of, of uh, uh, physical, mental, and sexual health. Then we have uh, also very, very important uh, point about uh, the condom, uh, usage of condom as an evidence uh, for, for this a person is doing sex work or that illegal activity of buying sex happened. That's why uh, I have found myself in a situation uh, uh, sometimes that persons are, no, like, do not give me so much condoms. Uh, I should not have at home that much. Or, ah, oh, fuck it, like, I will not use it. It's not good to have it uh, together with me. Uh, deportation is also like one of the effect and here, like I think in the case of, of the persons in focus, uh, we are not just talking about physical, mental and sexual health, we are actually talking about the lives of, of persons uh, who have been deported because at least uh, for those cases that I, some of these cases that I'm familiar uh, 
uh, about, we are talking about trans persons, we are talking about gay men coming from, uh, from the context where uh, homosexuality slash uh, um, uh, transgender identity is criminalized in addition to, to sex work. So uh, it is actually a, a, a consequence of, of uh, sex work as an activity for these persons, and that, that was a reason why they were deported. Uh, risk to report crime is also very much important, like related to, to someone mental health to high extent in a way that uh, just having this notion that even if something bad happened, most probably I don't have mechanisms to to report this, either because I'm uh, uh, not a Swedish uh, permanent residence or citizen, or because uh, it will really affect my business in the future. It will affect uh, my level of poverty and uh, many, many things uh, that could be like related to it. Uh, we have had the cases where, for example, the clients were the members of uh, uh, criminal uh, criminal groups uh, here in Stockholm, and then a situation happened that uh, uh, it became known that a person is doing a sex work, and then because uh, she had the clients who are uh, who were the part of this. Uh, criminal network in some way uh, the police already had an eye on them and then also uh, it became known to the police and uh, to of course like to to the judicial system that they have been buying sex and then we have like revenge uh, to those uh, sex workers as well as uh, violation of their safety. Do you have any questions when it comes to these before we go on the like concrete ones? But I cannot see you, so just speak uh, if you if you wish. Nope. Like um, I want to say something like like if you are undocumented mm -hmm. person and doing sex worker. Mm -hmm. And to have a trouble with uh, your client or police, and to how does this affect your like case? Also, this is so important topic. I think so. It is very very important topic. I think it depends, like from case to case. Um, uh, of course, I would say that. Uh, Police do not have obligation to get in touch with uh, migration services uh, in a, in the most like basic way that uh, they are checking you actually for the sex work activity and your uh, uh, status when it comes to to residence permit comes second. However, I think that. Once again, it depends uh, on on how what are the procedures. There are like differences from city to city uh, when it comes to to support. Uh, you could uh, find, uh, let's say, policemen who would. Uh, take uh, persons who are undocumented and put them in the safe houses uh, here in in. Um, uh, Stockholm, I know about those situations. So they were not deported, but they were just like helping them to be in these safe houses. But this is also a topic for itself. Uh, I am being recorded now, so I will not go deeply into that. But very much it is focused on this. Uh, I did something wrong treatment uh, and um, like uh, working on on. Uh, changing yourself and becoming better human being. And like, uh, for example, Ines, I like I was like sex worker and in Turkey, uh, and this was my 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 job. But when you come to another country or seeking asylum, yeah. you 
have to please everybody. You have to be good. You have to be like, um, you know, you have to be uh, in, in, uh, fit in the system. And uh, like for that, like uh, first things, what I think when I come from my home, com uh, home, fr uh, home country, I, yeah. I'm trans woman, I'm sex worker, I will uh, sell sex. But here, uh, if you are asylum and do sex worker, and this is affect your all process, affect your all cases, Absolutely. Bella, you know I what I think is important point, like you know that better than me, like you 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 know that probably how it is now. Uh there is also when I was doing my my research, like there is also uh, a reason why, for example, trans women in asylum process are doing sex work. Uh, because I remember when I was doing my research, it was 30 something Swedish crowns, it was like around three euros per day was the benefits for a person who is like yeah. in asylum process. Yeah. I don't know how it is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still the same. same. I come here like uh, like uh, 2017, still they say uh, pay same money, but everything is changed, everything is go up, like okay. uh, everything is expensive. But uh, in the like uh, uh, sport from uh, Migrohan Sport yet is still same. Exactly, and, uh, and for that, like when you do sex worker, or like uh, like you know when you are uh, like uh, uh, try to uh, survive for your life. And uh, there is uh, uh, another problem, another problem. Exactly. Okay, let's, uh, I cannot see if someone raised hand. So if no one, if you want to say something or ask, like you can just uh, do it. Otherwise I can just go on the next slide. So we managed to cover what I thought it would be good. Um, yes, so I mentioned uh, queer sex workers, I mentioned Red Umbrella, and I also mentioned Sexperterna sex work, where we generally have sex workers who are either uh, using uh, our counseling clinic or simply uh, are like uh, taking uh, all material that is like necessary for them for safer sex. Uh, or it can be advocacy and like wanted to be like more active when it comes to these questions. So these are sort of persons from which uh, I wrote these effects and that I could think about that are specifically like related to health uh, of the persons. Um, the first one would be definitely discrimination from healthcare professionals. Uh, there is a stigma, there is this uh, like judgment about, about the, the practice of selling sex that exists uh, within the society. Uh, even if it is not stigma about that, there is like this uh, narrative about uh, that every sex work, worker is a victim. And then uh, they find themselves in the situation that Every time if it happens that uh, sex work has to be exposed to healthcare professionals, the question is, oh, like, are you sure that is a smart thing to do? Oh, but you are such a beautiful girl. You could do so many things. This is a land of opportunities. Like, please, like, try. I can maybe help you to do something else, et cetera, et cetera, to, like, sending to, to exit programs. To, for example, um, asking, why are you coming like here so frequently, like to, to test yourself when you are a cis woman? 
So there is like this pressure sometimes even to say because you are testing yourself frequently, whatever that means, uh, that is coming from, from healthcare professionals. Uh, and I wrote here two gloves during medical checkups. Uh, it comes actually from this uh, report from uh, ESWA, European Sex Workers Alliance, that they actually talk about this approach of healthcare workers, like due to stigma, where they sort of as a as a uh, example, just like for this contest, like putting two gloves in order to to check to do a medical checkup. I we haven't had the cases that I've heard that someone put two gloves, but in in reality, that is what is what is happening uh, very often. Um, I'm just checking time now. It is four o'clock. I think that it would be good to, for this part here, when I talk about um, certain effect that is problematic, I want to touch upon what would be a strategy uh, in order to, to, to change this. Um, when it comes to discrimination from healthcare professionals, uh, I think I would say like two examples, two positive examples that we have had uh, within Sexpertina sex work. The first one is that uh, last year we organized Sex Health Conference, which is our yearly event. Uh, in our organization, and uh, the topic uh, was uh, um, uh, sex for compensation. Uh, and then we actually included uh, a lot of persons with like first-hand and direct experience uh, of, of sex work. In total, we had like 50 persons. I think, Bella, you can tell me if I'm wrong. I don't know if it was 20 or 25 persons with uh, like direct experience of, of sex work having conversation with healthcare professionals uh, on equal terms when it comes to their needs, etc. Uh, however, this was done in a way not like to, to, to feel that they are coming to unknown and this is something uncomfortable to do. Uh, we made sure to to fix that in 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 many aspects. For example, we chose a place for the fancy conference where we have, uh, let's say, healthcare professionals, some state officials, no police. Uh, at the spot, we made the conference at the uh, queer club here here in Stockholm and it was very interesting because like I mostly work with uh, MSM and trans sex workers like and that space is like very familiar for them so you could see just just this like level of comfort from the first moment and then you have like all of these experts in quotes that are like oh like where where am I where I'm supposed to go so yes. <laughs> Uh, so this this first example, as I said, was this uh, sex health conference. And the second aspect of the conference was that uh, it wasn't a situation where uh, we put them on the round table and then sort of uh, discussed about the issues. We had a scene where we had... Um, parallel uh, panel uh, discussions sla slash literal little lectures uh, where we had one representative of like uh, healthcare, like healthcare unit, one of these representatives from state agencies working with persons with uh, sex, uh, that has experience with sex work slash NGOs. And then we also had uh, two persons with like direct experience where they got a certain topic uh, to to tackle on and like to talk about what are the challenges, which kind of support, let's say, the agencies are providing. And uh, it was a very tra transparent in that way where we had the situation 
uh, like where this time like sex workers were judging i mean with all right the services that they are getting like aha okay you are providing that no i don't like it that doesn't work so it was a bit like of of that of that dynamic that is a bit uncommon uh here in in sweden of course with respect and uh to to everyone in the end uh and the second example that uh, we are doing right now, I'm working on that, is um, uh, education for healthcare professionals, uh, sort of small interactive workshops that we are going to do at the spot when it comes to uh, better uh, reception of sex workers within, within their units. And these are just examples from our uh, unit and like since... Uh, I am sure there are like pro maybe or probably other like positive examples, but I think I would mention these two. Uh, let me just go quickly here on uh, PrEP. Uh, like uh, that is uh, a medication that uh, makes a possibility uh, to get uh, HIV uh, uh, extremely, extremely little. Uh, and uh, it is very common, at least in Stockholm, in Sweden, for uh, gay men, uh, also uh, gay and bi men or MSM, uh, better to say like that. Uh, also, I would say for trans persons, though in the smaller extent, when it comes to sex workers, there are very, very, very few sex workers here in Stockholm that are on, on PrEP. Uh, because generally uh, when they are on PrEP, uh, there is like even additional um, uh, additional stigma like about that. Oh, that, that, does that mean that you do not wish to do a change? And sometimes uh, sex workers, in order to get the good service, they have to change their narrative to the organizations slash agencies slash uh, slash um, um, healthcare units that they are talking about. Uh, please do note that they are also in Sweden state agency that work against prostitution and human trafficking in some cases, or actually in, in many cities here in Sweden, they also have their own healthcare clinic that works with sex workers. So you see a connection there. And then also what I could also hear is like the stigma within pharmacies. Oh my God, you are a woman. Why are you taking this HIV medication? Like it, that is one of the responses that the person got and changed the strategy, uh, decided to just order it online uh, next time and, and continue, continue with PrEP. Uh, Substance use is also something that I mentioned, I think, before when I talked about uh, this like intersection of, of different experiences. Um, we can look at it like from, from many, many perspectives, and I guess uh, uh, Ari can tell you much better than I can, but uh, when we are talking about uh, specifically MSM and, and trans persons uh, and sex workers who are not uh, cisgender uh, or heterosexual, many times uh, substance use can be actually connected or associated with, uh, with uh, their identities uh, and uh, who they are uh, outside of being a sex worker. So there is like this uh, common uh, now like um, how can I say um, issue that has been like more explored within Swedish media chem sex is becoming a thing now mainstream media is like talking about that and chem sex is in that way uh, uh, also very connected to the sex workers community that we are working with however it is an effect of this like legal and social obstacles I am really not trying to put it like in a way uh, that like substance use equals like discrimination from healthcare professionals. I just think, and that is my, um, how can I say, uh, 
what I could come with a conclusion so far that when we are talking about substance use because a person, uh, it makes person feels good, I would say that that is much preferable way to, to use substances or preferred way to, to, to use substances. But hearing that uh, 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 many of sex workers are doing that in order to deal with anxiety and stress and a lot of this like internalized uh, whore phobia, this is how it is called into sex uh, positive circles. Uh, where uh, they feel guilt and shame about what they are doing, although sometimes they are not uh, thinking about that on a conscious level, but in some in some ways, in some other practices, you can see that they are very much affected uh, by the social context, by the uh, anxiety and stress about waiting if um, uh, police will come or not, uh, is client going to be violent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of persons that I had a chance to talk with that are like using substances. Uh, generally like downers in order to to handle uh, that anxiety that has been uh, happening around their business. Lastly, when it comes to these effects, since we, we have a limited time, I would like just to mention again, like this uh, 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 effect of social and legal context of on clients' behavior. I said this already, like I'm not, uh, I am the one doing crime argument, but also being aware that you cannot really do freely sex, uh, freely sex work as a uh, migrant in Sweden and a lot of blackmailing, a lot of, uh, violent behavior uh, situations where clients are not paying uh, while knowing that a person is not in so, is in so much privileged position. So their safety is very much compromised in that way. Generally, uh, migrant sex workers that I uh, have been like knowing since I'm like here in Stockholm, many of them are uh, trying to hide and not reveal for anyone that they are actually uh, uh, here on a, some short residence permit or undocumented. On the other hand, they are just like saying that uh, are Swedish and sometimes pretending that they are Swedish or from some EU country uh, because the possibility for a client to uh, feel that can manipulate manipulate over their decisions and bodies is uh, lower. At least that is often in the sex worker's head, migrant sex worker's head. We will leave this for question and answers that we should start very soon. Am I right? Um, but I just want to show you two more examples, at least I have time. It will be very sh short. Uh, so other part of Sexpert and other, that I'm working with is called CAMSAVE. So we are working with harm reduction programs uh, for persons who use drugs. Many of them are also sex workers. And here we have like these like brochures where uh, for, uh, they are in Swedish and in English, where they can get a little bit more information how to act in cases of overdose. And please do note that this is not exclusively related to sex workers community. I mean, there are a lot of clients who are using drugs. And as a sex worker, it is very important to know how to handle um, uh, overdose and, and uh, prevent it. Uh, and this is like also a part, one of these, like, uh, uh, if I can say, uh, not maybe strategy, but a, a little harm reduction uh, initi initiative that could be relevant uh, for this um, substance use in connection to, to sex work. I think I don't have time.